All right, so in this video, we're going to talk all about basic statistical symbols and language, and then we'll move on to analyzing bar charts. Then we'll talk about cross tabulation and finally comparing results between two groups. So it can seem daunting to dive into your data. However, the key to success is really taking it part by part, and there are a couple guidelines you're going to want to follow throughout this process. First, Begin with that first domain of questions in your program evaluation tool and focus on your analysis one domain at a time. So our program evaluation tools are built in this funneling approach, right? Where we first look at what's happening and how often, and then when things happen, how effective or ineffective are they? Then we have that next domain of how prepared, knowledgeable, and skilled are stakeholders at the site to implement those practices. So you're going to take it domain by domain through those three domains there. You'll begin your analysis with each domain looking at the multiple choice or Likert questions. So maybe that's your single Likert questions or your multiple choice ranking grids. And if there are any conditional open responses related to any of those multiple choice questions, analyze them right after you analyze the data from the previous question. So that looks like maybe you've asked a question about how often a particular self-determination assessment is being used. And then you had follow-up questions about um, the particular uh, level of effectiveness, right? So maybe you were looking at the effectiveness of that, that tool and then having open-ended responses from stakeholders, maybe teachers, about what effectiveness looks like or why it's difficult uh, or ineffective to use that tool. So we're going to go domain by domain. That's the thing to remember. Bring it part by part. And the goals for your quantitative analysis are to identify the highest and lowest ranked practices from your ranking questions, identify the areas of strength and need from those multiple ranking questions. Then you're going to look at cross tabulations. So that question is all about what do specific groups do or need um, better than the others, right? So a cross tabulation, as we'll see later on in this video, can tell us whether teachers are doing something more than job coaches or job coaches are more prepared to do something than teachers. And then we'll finish off um, your analysis with looking at results from a group comparison. And we'll see, let's say we're talking about those teachers and those job coaches again, that maybe one of those groups, maybe teachers have a statistically significant um, more knowledge or skill level than the job coaches in a particular um, area of practice or vice versa. All right, so let's get started. Part one, basic statistical symbols and language. So before we get started, let's just do a quick refresher on stat language. So we use the lowercase n to represent the word sample size and an uppercase n to represent population size. And since you are not conducting sampling from an entire population for your study, you're not going to be using that uppercase n. Um, so you're not sampling every single teacher in your school or every stakeholder in your agency. So how do we use this small n? Well, here's an example. Uh, maybe my question was, uh, please rate your level of skill for how to make ice cream. And so I would write that up when asked, please rate your level of skill for how to make ice cream. 45% of dog walkers, lowercase n equals 179, selected novice. So that's an example of how we would use that n as we do our write-up. So we would always have the percentage first, the percentage of participants who selected a particular response, and then we would follow that up in... Um, Next, right next to that 45% our N and then what that raw number is of the amount of participants who had selected that, that response option of novice in that case. So for the remainder of these uh, slides I'm going to show you in this video, in this conversation, I'm going to use lowercase n to represent sample um, rather than saying um, sample size out each time. All right. So the big question always is, I've got results, I've done the test, how do I write them up? Um, so writing your results, and I'm going to call this formatting 101 here, we can break that down into kind of a three-stage process. Um, this is particular to your Likert questions. So we're only talking about your quantitative questions, your Likert questions here. Um, so maybe that's a single or multiple choice ranking grid. So what you want to do is rephrase the question, just like we had before. You want to state the population that responded. So whether that's 
teachers or job coaches or agency staff, um, power professionals, administrators, um, mentors, young people, whoever it is, family members. Um, you're going to state who responded and then present the results in order from greatest to least. So remember, we're talking about Likert questions here, so we're always ranking them. So a common format example that you can and you should use um, would be reframe the question and then talk about the population evaluated. So for example here, when asked to rate their level of skill in monitoring student progress toward their soft skill goals within their work-based learning experiences, so that's our reframing the question. And then special education teachers, that's our population, our sample, n equals 83, said that they are at novice level, right? So that's the rank option, the highest rank option, n equals 57 or 47%, followed by intermediate with n equals 21 at 17%, or experts, and that's n equals 5 or 4%. So you see there that I have reframed the question in yellow. I have in blue the, the sample, the population that's being focused on, and then I have from greatest to least, the rank options there. So that's not representative of your actual rank scale. So you see here that novice was the highest selected option. I'm not putting them in highest to lowest according to my scale. So from expert, intermediate, and novice, I'm putting it from highest to lowest in terms of how many people responded more than others to, the, to each option. So in this case, novice is first because it has the highest amount of responses compared to the other two response options. All right, part two, analyzing bar charts. So bar charts are gonna be in Google Forms for you automatically made. Um, but we'll also talk about a little bit later on in this video on how to make these yourself within Excel. Um, but regardless, the interpretation is the same, whether it's in Google or it's Excel or any other program, bar charts, they're always going to be interpreted the same in terms of this visual analysis approach that we're doing. So when we're looking at analyzing bar charts, for us, we are using what's called visual analysis. We're not doing any calculation. Um, at this point. We'll do that a little later on in this video. So in my example here, I have a bar chart. It has uh, responses to the question, please rate your level of skill in monitoring student progress toward their soft skill goals within their work-based learning experiences. So this is continuing on from that previous example we just looked at. And I have the results from uh, my one group of participants. So in my example here, I um, I put a program evaluation tool out to teachers, special education teachers, let's say. Um, this is just example data, does, it's not actually real. Um, and I gave them this question on a three-point scale from expert, immediate, to novice. So we can see here that um, we have a pretty big difference between uh, novice, intermediate, and expert in terms of the amount of people who responded to each of these. And we interpret this um, by figuring out which rank option has the highest frequency of responses for that particular practice. So remember each one of your questions in your program evaluation tool is aligned to an evidence-based practice or promising practice within the literature that you identified in your literature analysis. So um, our goal is to figure out which one of the practices that is being evaluated by this question um, has the so which, which response option uh, is the highest for that practice? So our practice in this case is soft skills within work-based learning, um, and we're looking at monitoring student progress, right? And then we see that novice is the most selected option, followed by intermediate and then expert, because there are 57 responses for novice, 21 for intermediate, and five for expert. And then we would write our results up by saying, um, when asked to rate their level of knowledge of skill in monitoring student progress toward their soft skill goals within their work-based learning experiences, see how I just rephrased the whole question right there? And then comma, um, most teachers said that they are at a novice level, and then I give my raw number and my frequency, um, my percentage, right? And then I would say with others identifying as having um, intermediate skill, and then I give my quantitative results and a few with my quantitative results being experts. So it is okay, um, expected and welcome for you to do your own interpretation and use the um, 
the numerical results to back up what you're saying. So you see here, I didn't just say novice, intermediate, expert um, from highest to lowest. I gave it some context. So I said most teachers are at a novice level and then others are intermediate and then a few because only five of them selected as being experts. So you wanted to read like an explanation and your own synthesis or interpretation of the results versus just a bulleted list. That's what you don't want to have or a sentence that feels like a list. So analyzing multiple choice ranking grid data in Excel um, is typically a, uh, a wonky and inefficient process um, because the way that Google does this is it puts a bunch of bar charts like we saw in our previous example in a row with each other and it forces you to do um, a really subjective visual analysis that can be time consuming. So what we want to do instead is go through the process of copy and pasting your data into the data tool I created for you, um, the Excel sheet, and then having that auto create for you a um, a line chart that is much easier to interpret than what Google gives you. It makes your visual analysis much easier. So um, for this part of, of the example, what we're going to do for multiple choice ranking grid questions is you're going to want to open up the file. It's called SPED 6214 Session 8 Data Tool. Um, you're going to re review the first tab of the file, which has a completed example but we're about to do, and then navigate to the tab Your Data Tool. And once you're there, you'll write in the frequency of responses for each category of your results. You'll copy and paste those right from your Google Sheet. And then you'll create a table within the numerical results that you just added. So that might sound complicated, and that's totally okay. Um, but we're going to go through it step by step now, and I'll show you what it looks like. Um, the important thing to remember is that it's 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 really important to take a look at that first tab of that example of how things are done um, before you take a stab at doing it yourself and copying your own data in. So if we look at our Excel sheet here, you'll see on that first tab, it says uh, the first tab is called multi-rank uh, analysis example. You see here I have a... Um, uh, fictitious data here of a three-point scale. It's expert, intermediate, intermediate and novice. Um, so three rank option. And then I have, this is a multiple choice ranking grid, right? So I have multiple categories of sub practices that are involved here. So I have achievement tests, adaptive behavior tests, aptitude tests, right? So all, all of these nine here are um, different types of age appropriate transition assessment. And so if, if I was doing this, what I would have done is copied in the numbers or wrote in the numbers if you want to um, from my Google form directly into these boxes here. So when I'm, when I'm saying these boxes, I mean the cells um, B4 to G14. So B4 to G14 is what I had uh, copied in here. You may go all the way, um, you know, and use rank uh, four and five if you had a five, four or five rank scale. Um, or option number 10 if you had 10 practices there. So once you copy in all of your um, data from Google, from your, from your multiple choice ranking question within your uh, Google Sheet, you will then see automatically this chart for you. So it'll create the chart automatically for you um, as long as you don't mess with any of the other boxes around it. So I've designed it to kind of make this process easy for you as long as you don't copy or paste any other parts of this table. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, so let's take a look at how to actually analyze um, through visual analysis these multi-rank grid question results. So let's say that I had the question um, please rate your ability to incorporate the following types of assessment into your curriculum to support student growth towards transition goal. So maybe I had a multiple choice ranking grid question um, that had asked about a, a bunch of different age appropriate transition assessments um, and implementing those as a support in the curriculum um, for students to build uh, their knowledge and competence or something like that towards their transition related goals. So 
what the what this visual analysis is going to show before we do any type of interpretation this just this, this data visualization is on the bottom all of your different practices that were in your multiple choice ranking your question so that's on your x axis that's your horizontal axis so going from left to right and then going up you're going to have your scale right and that scale for these cases is going to be the amount of individuals from your from your program eva evaluation tool that selected that particular response so in this example that we have here you'll see that um, I have achievement tests, adaptive behavior tests, right? So all these age appropriate assessments. And then I have a, a scale on the side from zero to 70 um, because my sample size was 70 in this, in this fake example here. So now that you have your, your multi-line chart here for your multiple choice ranking grid, um, this chart shows all the practices ranked across the three levels of your scale or four or five levels of your scale, depending on what your scale is. Um, and what our goal here is to identify the peak and the lowest point of each line. So here's how we would interpret it. Let's start with our novice first. Um, so the highest point for novice in this example we see here is about 66, and that's for intelligence tests. And then we see our lowest point is for achievement tests, and that's at 10, right? So our most selected option um, for novice level is intelligence tests, while the um, lowest selected option is for achievement tests for novice. Uh, for intermediate, we see the highest point is career development measures, and then the lowest point is for intelligence tests again. And then for expert, we see the highest point is for achievement tests, and the lowest point is for interest inventories. So given that, um, and I recommend that you write up your your initial interpretation that way before you take a, a crack at putting a uh, cohesive summary together. Um, so you see here I have novice and then I have two bullet points and then I have intermediate two bullet points and expert two bullet points for whatever your scale is. I recommend you doing the same format before you um, write your, your short paragraph. But let's say that you have this list here that, that I had just gone through. Then you would write your results as the following way. Um, so results indicated that teachers and equal 70 rated themselves as having the lowest level of ability, which is novice, and 67 or 95.7% in incorporating the use of intelligence tests into their curriculum. And we know that because our, um, our visual analysis told us that the, the greatest area of need, so the highest number of responses for novice, was intelligence tests into the curriculum when supporting student growth towards transition goals. And teachers rated their highest level of skill being the use of achievement tests, which was expert, N equals 40 or 57%, as well as intermediate, which is N equals 20, 28%. So the reason why um, achievement tests are the highest, um, the, the greatest area of strength of skill for teachers uh, in regard to using um, assessment as part of the curriculum to support student growth towards transition goals is because achievement tests had the highest number of responses out of the sample for um, for expert uh, f and then also followed by uh, intermediate. And just to recap, you see here that I first looked at the uh, this this visualization here of my um, number of responses for each practice across all of the practices in the multiple choice ranking grid and then I looked uh, each level of my scale for the highest and lowest point and that that allowed me in the end to see which practice had the highest amount of responses for novice because I know this is my greatest area of um, need for skill development for for my sample and then I was able to identify the highest number of responses for my highest rank option, which in this case was for achievement tests. And another way that we can think about that <coughs> is looking at, um, if, if, we're, if we're trying to look at broader trends, not just for the highest or lowest, we can look at the, the range, um, both visually and numerically, 
between our highest and lowest points across multiple practices. So you can certainly continue to analyze the lines after identifying the highest and lowest by following the same process for the remaining categories. Um, so if we know that intelligence tests are the lowest and achievement tests are the highest rank, then we continue looking for high and low for the seven remaining categories in this example. And this gray shaded region I have overlaid here um, it's just a, a representation that shows the areas of greatest need. So notice how the totals for novice are the highest here, and the totals for expert and intermediate are the lowest here. Um, so these are the places where the gaps between the highest and lowest skills are the greatest. So you see numerically and visually, um, these are the greatest areas of difference, right? So you've got, um, you're, you're talking about three responses for intelligence tests uh, for intermediate um, versus... Uh, 66 or 67 for um, novice level for that. So that's a wide difference, right? And and while those differences aren't as extreme for aptitude and interest inventories, they are significantly greater um, than, let's say, adaptive behavior tests, which are, you know, between five uh, responses from each other. So you can also see there was another, um, another gap or, or spike in in, uh, in skill levels around job evaluations and self-determination assessments in this example. So I see that space being much larger than the other um, ranges, both numerically and visually. Take a few moments, you can pause the video if you'd like, and then uh, ready, ready to jump back in, or if you are ready to jump in now, we can continue. All right, so cross tabulations. This is all about breaking down your results to see how particular groups responded. And then you're able to compare um, between those groups how they responded. So in order to do this, you're gonna need to open up that uh, or continue to have open that file that we just looked at before, um, our data example tool. So that's SPED 6214 session eight data tool before continuing. Um, and I have that file for you in um, the Session 8 Content Module folder on Blackboard for this week. And you're also going to need to download your data from um, Google and open it in Excel to do any of the things we are talking about in this upcoming example. Um, you don't have to do it for this video in particular because you haven't collected data yet. Um, but in order to do your cross-tabulation, if you want to go back later on, you'll have to have some type of data. Um, because the data I'm going to use is, is just a, a fictitious example I've created um, to show you guys. So you don't need to have any data right now. We're just going to go through the process. So cross-tabulation, as I said, is all about analyzing results for a specific group. And if you want to look at how many individuals from each group chose a specific response, then you need to use the approach called cross-tabulation. In this approach, you'll create a multi-category table that breaks down the results for each group individually. And your results in Google are going to be automatically visualized, but they are never broken down by group. So this is really the only way to do that by downloading them from Google and then putting them in Excel because you'll have them visualized automatically in Google, but it will never cross tab for you to just give you bar charts as we were looking at before, um, which is not really practical um, for the deeper level analysis we want to do. And it's not possible at all to do a cross tabulation based upon what Google gives you. It's just, it's just not feasible. Um, so in terms of cross tabulation, so like what kind of questions are we trying to answer by doing this? So if we're looking at differences between groups, then this can tell us how many individuals in one specific group chose a particular rank option as opposed to the individuals in another group. So that could be how many special education teachers chose a particular resp res um, response option or rank option as compared to general education teachers, right? So how many chose expert versus um, how many chose expert for general education teachers for some practice. And this can also tell you how many individuals who chose one specific response on one question chose a specific response on another related question. So for, for example, maybe you're just looking at, rather than comparing two groups, you're looking at how special education teachers, if they said they're doing a practice, um, how many of those who said they were doing a practice all the time also said that it was very effective. So you get to see that um, that ongoing 
uh, additional trend in the data. So this is why we do funneling, right? So in our program evaluation tools, we do funneling to look at how often things happen and then how effective they are when they happen um, before we then look at how prepared, knowledge, or skilled um, individuals are to do those practices. So cross tabulation is really cool because then you can follow the funneling of your program evaluation tool in terms of your analysis as well. So you could look at how many teachers had said they do something all the time and it's also effective when they do it or maybe it's ineffective when they do it, right because that's also possible. We know there are many instances in our professional practice where we are um, it's just common norm that we're doing this particular assessment or tool, um, but it isn't the best way to do it, um, and it's not effective, but that's just how things are done, right? So it's important to see um, how people are responding across your funneling question. So you can see not just if people are doing things often and if they think they're effective, but how many individuals who do something a particular way also think that it's effective or not work or maybe not working. So in order to make a cross tabulation in Excel um, that we can then uh, use to analyze and compare our results either between groups or across questions, the first thing you want to do once you have your data downloaded from Google and put into Excel is to select in the insert tab um, recommended pivot tables and you're when you do that you're going to make sure that you've highlighted the column with the grouping variable uh, and the response options for the rank option so if there are multiple columns apart the easiest option is to hide those columns and then highlight both columns together so let's say I have a uh, rank uh, demographic question about professional role and I've collected survey uh, program, program evaluation data from transition specialists and job coaches and special education teachers in my example here um, and I want to look at the differences between um, how my special education teachers job coaches and transition specialists had rated their ability to incorporate self-determination assessments into curriculum and maybe they're ranking that on a three-point scale so what I would do is highlight both of those columns together both the demographic question and the um, column with the question and option res uh, response options um, and responses from my participants. And let's say I had another question between these that I wasn't interested in doing a cross tabulation for. I would just hide that um, where you just click on that column and right click and then click hide um, and get rid of it and then highlight because otherwise it'll put that in the cross tabulation as well and then we'll have results in there that we don't want. So once you click on that button that's that um, that says recommended pivot tables, um, it's going to create a new tab for you on your Excel sheet. And um, you see here in this example, that's what it's going to look like. So it will end up uh, having all of your different um, demographic um, roles. So I have job coaches, special education teacher, and transition specialist in this example, but it won't have any numerical results yet. We have to tell it which um, results to put in there. So specifically, we need to tell it um, where to put our response options for each group. Um, so that sounds complicated, but it, it's, it's pretty simple. So what we will do is we will drag the question variable to the values box and that will tell the analysis which response frequency to count. So what we don't want it to do is to count how many professionals were professionals, right? So we already, if, if we had dragged down professional role into values, it would just tell us the amount of um, the sample size for each one of those groups, which is, we already know that, that's not helpful for us. We want to know how many of each of those groups selected a particular response. So we're going to drag down, please, in this example, please rate your ability, write this question down into the values. So uh, you can think about this as well as you want to drag down your independent variable of this question down into the values because that's what we're trying to measure how often that practice happens. And then you want to make sure you also drag in um, please rate your ability, write that independent variable, that practice into uh, columns and you want rows, right? The rows are already going to be there for you. 
that's your demographic variable. So you just have to drag down your, um, your practice into values and you'll be ready to go after that. And then just click OK and the pivot table, the cross tab table, um, it'll be called pivot table in, in Excel for you, but it's a cross tab table, will be created um, in that new tab that it had made for you. And so, in, so once you have that chart, our, our question as always is how do we analyze that, right? So the cross tabulation table is an analysis that shows a breakdown of results according to professional role. Um, so in my example here, it's a demographic variable. Um, and you could do that same process to show a breakdown of results for how many participants chose a particular response. Um, so going back to our other example, maybe I cross tab between um, the, you know, just looking at special education teachers and maybe I had a, this same question in terms of how often self-determination assessments happen and then how effective they are. Um, so regardless, the analysis is, is the same here. So you can see that in my rows, I have my different demographic variables. And then I have in each one of those columns are um, B, C, and D. There are my columns. I have my, my scale, my rank options. So I have a three-point scale of expert, intermediate, and novice. And then it shows me uh, for this example that seven job coaches selected expert, um, seven selected intermediate, and eight inter um, for novice. And it gives me a grand total at the end. Um, if you have any blanks, it'll give you blanks, but it won't count them. And that would be a grand total of 22 for that example, right? So you can see here that you, you can look by row for each group and then by column for each response option. And then you have grand totals on the, um, in, in the far right column would be the grand total for each group. And then in each column, the last row will have the grand total for each response option, right? So my grand total on, on the far right there is 22, and that's just the amount of responses overall for job coaches, right? So we already know that. That's our sample size. But it's interesting to see in my column B at the very bottom, so that's my row 9 in this example, um, that my grand total is 15 and that represents the amount of individuals across these three groups that that selected expert so this is what we call aggregating right because it's it's bringing in all of these groups together into into one final number so while the grand total on the far right is not helpful to you because you already know your sample size um, what is helpful for you is to look at the grand totals in each column for those r those rank options because then you can, uh, in a quick and easy way, see both your overall results for each rank option but also your, your group-specific results for each response option. All right, so part four is comparing results between groups. You're going to need to keep this example data file open um, in order to follow along. And if you were to do this, and like, let's say you want to watch the video again when you have your data analysis, which I recommend doing, um, you'd want to have your data open and follow along with this process. But for this, you don't have to have your data open. All right, so comparing results between two groups. So what are we doing? Well. If you have conducted a study where you've collected data on a, an exclusive demographic variable um, with, with two options, so let's say it's whether or not they are a teacher or an agency staff, for example, um, but they cannot select both options. So you can't be a teacher and an agency staff. You're either one of the other. That's what it means by exclusive. Then you have the possibility of assessing if the responses from one of these independent groups are different than the responses from another group's responses for a particular area of practice. Um, so it's important to remember that you can only do this if you have a demographic variable where teachers are, are in this in this study of yours are only teachers and agency staff are only agency staff. Um, where they're only able to select one of those options, and they truly are only one of those options, right? So it's one thing to make a question and force people to respond in a particular way, but it's another thing to be sure that the people who have responded to that question are either one of those things, right? So <clears throat> if that is true in your study, um, then by doing a comparison between two groups, 
we're conducting an analysis that would tell you if, for instance, in your study, one group has a statistically significant more, uh, let's say, knowledge or skill level um, than others, than another group. Um, so we would see maybe statistically, statistically significantly more or less. Um, that could be more knowledge, uh, less knowledge. It could be hap some, a practice being used more or less often. Um, it could be a knowledge or skill level, right? But we're looking for a difference between two independent groups um, on, on one of our practices. So what does statistical significance mean? Um, so in the context of Likert, questions, um, right? So Likert questions are rank, meaning that they um, are not on what we, we typically consider a um, an interval or a ratio scale, right? Thinking back to high school here, um, and if, if any of us are, are working with students and teaching core mathematics, that we, we know that Likert questions are, are, are a type of ranking scale, right? They're not ordinal. Uh, they are ordinal. They are not um, interval or ratio. So because they're ordinal, we have to think about this a little bit differently, and I'm going to explain that in a second. So when we want to see if one group has a higher result than the other, we're making an alternative claim to what expected, to what is expected, and that's called an alternative hypothesis because we think that one group will have a higher result and that this difference between the two groups is not due to random chance, puppies, or ghostbusters. So here's the difference, because we have an ordinal scale, and we can't do things like take means, right? We can't take the mean or the variance of that, because um, the the space between our, our response options is subjective, right? So so we, it's hard to measure the difference between expert and um, intermediate. It's subjective. We made that. We made that up, right? So because of that, um, because we don't have numbers one, two, three that are measurable, right? Even if we had given a person between two and three, it's still a rank because we can't we can't see that that two or three um, in in real life. So um, we're looking here that is the result from one group not due to random chance. So in statistics, uh, the alternative hypothesis is always something that is happening. Um, so our testing always assumes that nothing is different. And this is our, d our default assumption. Um, and then statistically significant means that we're going to reject that notion that nothing is different. Um, that idea that t the test we're going to do and we're going to talk about in a moment always assumes that nothing is different, everything is the same between these two groups we're, we're comparing. It's called the null hypothesis. We're just saying that um, on, you know, in, in common occurrence, on, on everyday basic um, experience that nothing is different. And our goal is to run this test and say, but wait, there is a difference and that difference meets a particular threshold. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. And when it meets that threshold, um, we call that statistical significance because it has gone above and beyond the the um, level of criteria we need to say that this isn't due to chance, that teachers uh, don't have more knowledge than agency folk about a particular type of curriculum um, just because this is the group you picked and maybe they had their Wheaties for breakfast that day. Um, they've had extra coffee, so they're really feeling ready to go, right? It's that they... Um, that they are different for a particular reason other than random chance, um, puppies or ghostbusters. So our hypothesis then is that when we run our analysis, we're checking to see if our, if this alternative hypothesis that, that the idea that nothing is different is wrong um, is true, that one group is presenting results that are higher than the other group above and beyond random chance. So that's our final important thing to remember that not only is this not due to chance, but it's above and beyond random chance. So we know that there are things, you know, something, someone had something going on, right? There are many different things that, that um, influence the practices that we're measuring, right? They could be individual, they could be with the school, with teams, um, with the district, whatever they are. So above and beyond the random chance of things that could influence, um, there is something statistically significant. There's a difference between these two groups, um, and we're trying to identify that. So we we answer this question um, by a test called the Mann-Whitney U-Test, and that is a 
a fancy name for a statistical test that measures whether or not um, a randomly selected score from one person. So if we took, we randomly selected one score from one of our teachers, um, whether or not that's greater than the score from one person in our second group. And what the test does is it takes every possible pair. Um, so every teacher compared to every teacher, <coughs> sorry, every teacher compared to every, let's say, agency person who took the program evaluation tool. Um, so everyone compared to everyone and vice versa. So, um, so randomization here in the test um, reduces the likelihood that one group is greater than the other because of that random chance because we are just randomly selecting um, pairing up everyone with everyone else so every single person is paired with every other person and looking at whether or not their scores are different from each other so that's what our test is going to do in the background you won't actually do that at all we will do we'll have SPSS do that for us but it's important to understand what SPSS is doing behind the scenes so it doesn't just look like um, the Ghostbusters or puppies are or unicorns are back there doing our analysis for us right it's important to understand exactly what's going on because then it helps us to understand what the results mean so just to recap this test I'm about to show you how to run is taking each person from one group and comparing them to each and every person in the other group. So every single person is matched with every other person. And when it does that match, it says, is your score higher or is your score higher? Which one is higher? Okay. And then it pairs that person with the next person. Is your score higher or is your next person's higher? And then what happens is you have the amount of responses, amount of people in the one group versus the other group. And the test will say, okay, so group A had um, a, uh, more responses for the, for, the highest, for the highest score option. All right, so now that we know what SPSS is actually doing in the background, let's go through the process of making it do that test for us and how to analyze the results. <clears throat> so ground rules for comparing two groups. Um, in order to compare two groups, we have to have a dependent variable that needs to be on the ranking scale, right? So we have a Likert scale here um, that we're going to be comparing the responses for between two groups. <clears throat> so that's our dependent variable. And our independent variable in this case is um, our categorical role. So our two professional roles that we're trying to compare against each other. So this is really important. Um, to to ingrain in you um, to keep in your mind when you go into SPSS because it'll ask you to drag and drop um, which one of these dependent which is the dependent and which is the independent variable <clears throat> and this is different than our research question right so we're not talking about our dependent variable from a research question or independent variable from our research question we're talking about um, our practice and our groups so the dependent variable is the practice and the <coughs> the independent variable in this case is going to be our group. So it's a little bit different than how we've typically been thinking about it. <clears throat> so before we go through the process of, of putting this into SPSS, we need to format our, our data um, in a particular way. <clears throat> so we're going to have to set the, the data file up to make our work in SPSS easier. And we'll do that by what's called recoding. So the reason why we need to do this be is because SPSS doesn't see the word intermediate, novice, or expert, right? We need to assign, by recoding, numerical codes to those three rank options. So assign in <coughs> uh, the, the highest rank option gets the highest number, second rank option gets the second highest number, and so on for your entire scale. And then you also need to recode your role. So your general education teacher and your SPED teacher in this example, but your, your demographics may be different for your two roles that you're comparing. So um, you're only going to use zeros and ones. And the way that this works is a general education teacher is a zero, and then a SPED teacher is one. You could give them either or. 
um, but this just tells SPSS whether or not the response is from a SPED teacher or a Gen teacher. So you're going to want to do that recoding for both of your um, of your variables. So you want to have your demographic variable and the uh, variable related to the practice that you're that you're looking to see differences between two groups. So when you da download your data from Google Forms, it's going to look like this example here. And I said that won't work in SPSS because SPSS can't compute words. We need that all in number form. <clears throat> so how do we actually do this recoding, right? Well, so if you're looking at the um, data tool example, you can navigate to the fourth tab for recode your data. Um, and I have a full example there actually on the third tab, right? So if you go to the third tab, you'll see um, a completed example of recoded data for you already. So you'll see here that I started off with my role and that's gen teacher and sped teacher. Um, and then I had my second column there was all of my response options and I recoded them um, to, to numbers for both of them. So once I've done that, you'll see that I have a zero for gen and then a one for sped. Um, but how to actually do that process is you'll go to edit in the top bar um, on the toolbar of Excel and then you'll um, scroll down to find in the menu option and then click replace and then what you'll do is you will recode the demographic variable by um, highlighting the column for the demographic variable and then you'll type in each group name one at a time in the find field and type the number that you want to replace it with. This is much faster than going one by one for every novice typing uh, one, every intermediate typing two, and every expert typing three. So you can just click, you can write in under replace with um, expert and then you can um, uh, replace with three, sorry, and you would, when you type in you would say uh, find expert and then replace with uh, three in this example here. So you would highlight the column, um, replace, and then you will um, replace all the different rank options with their corresponding numerical option. And you would do that for the question, for the, the practice being measured, and also the grouping variable. Um, you can click re replace all to make the recode happen for every single response, and that saves you time instead of having to click find next, find next, find next, um, for however many responses you have, that can be kind of tedious. So once you've done this process of recoding, your data should um, look like this example I've shown here where you have both your grouping variable and your um, practice, your, your um, practice is looking for differences between the two groups on as um, uh, numerical from, you know, maybe it's a four point scale, so from four to one or three to one if it's a three point scale. Um, your codes will be different than this example, obviously, depending on what your um, your scaling is. <coughs> so let's say that we've completed this process of recoding our data. So, hurrah, we are ready to actually do our analysis to have SPSS run that test to look between the two groups and see if there's a statistically significant difference um, between the two of them. So what we're going to want to do is we'll open up SPSS. Um, we will go to File once SPSS is open. Um, file, Open, then Data, and then we'll select the, um, the file that we had just um, edited for ourselves. So in this example here, I have my, my fake data set that we've been looking at as an example. Um, and you can certainly follow along and use that fake data set within SPSS to um, get some practice with this test before you do it on your own data. Um, but for this for for this process, you'd be doing this with your own data as well when when it comes time. Um, in your example, when you're actually doing this with your test data, you're going to want to um, click on that worksheet drop down menu and just select, the tab from the Excel sheet that relates to the 
questions that you have. So it's likely that you only have one tab in yours, so by default it should be fine. Um, but in case you have multiple tabs for some reason in yours, um, you're going to want to make sure you click on the right tab from that drop down menu. And then you're going to want to make sure that all of those menu options there are checked. Um, <clears throat> so read value names, blah, 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 all those five options, just make sure they're checked. And that'll make sure that your data comes in clean with no errors. And then you click OK. So once you've opened up SPSS and you have uploaded your data, <clears throat> you're going to um, see this format here in SPSS. So you're going to want to use the values menu to tell SPSS what 1 and 0 mean. Um, this is this seems counter counterintuitive, but essentially we have to put our our numerical options back into text options. Be, well, you, you could leave it, um, but in your results, it'll just say one or zero, and then you would have to remember what one and zero are. This is a way that if you'd like to have it give you words after it does its numerical test, you could do that. So essentially what SPSS can do is after you've done your numerical test, it can recode them back into words for you if you wanted to do that. And this is how you would do that. So you would select the values box, um, for the for each row of the variable there, and then you could um, type in the numerical number, right? So zero equals um, gen teacher and one equals sped, and the label is the word that you want it to, to SPSS to recode it to. Um, so it won't do that in your data; it'll just say that in the results when it gives you your results, and we'll see that in a moment. So this can really aid in your interpretation, um, because otherwise, what happens is you have um, uh, your results from your test, from your man with you test, and then it says zero, 01, and then it says 1, 2, 3, and sometimes they can get confusing about what you're looking at. All right, so at this point in step four, all of your data is clean, it's ready to go, it's ready to run the test. And in step four, <clears throat> we begin by navigating um, to the Analyze menu in SPSS, and we scroll down to Non-Parametric Tests, and then we scroll down again to Legacy Dialogues, and then finally we click on Independent Samples, and um, when we click on Independent Samples, a new box will appear, um, and this is going to be where we'll type in our settings for our Man Whitney U test. So once you've gone through that menu and clicked on um, that option, you'll get a new box and it says two independent samples tests, right? Because our two groups are independent from each other. We have maybe in, in our example, we have here um, general education and special education teachers are, are independent from each other. And we're looking for our group differences between them. So what we're gonna wanna do is drag <coughs> or use the arrows, sorry, you can uh, use the arrows from that um, left box there to move them into their proper spots on in those two right boxes. So you're going to move your um, your arrow, move your question, your your practice into the test variable because we're testing to see if the different if the um, the results for that practice are different between two groups. And then, obviously, you move your role into the grouping variable. So you move your practice into the test variable and your grouping variable, your role variable, into grouping. Um, <clears throat> and then you want to click on Define Groups and make sure that you put Group 1 as 0 and Group 2 as 1. So by doing that, you say that group zero, at least in this example, so group one is general education teachers and group two is special education teachers. But what you're doing is telling SPSS that this group is group one and this group is group two. You're just letting it know which, which groups it's comparing. So by doing this here, really the only difference is you're deciding are you comparing um, your teachers your SPED teachers to GEN teachers or GEN teachers to SPED teachers. So what that would look like in, in terms of your analysis is that if SPED teachers were um, had, had more knowledge or skill or do something more often than the GEN teachers, then the results would be all positive versus using um, GEN teachers first, then all the results would show a decline. Um, so it just depends on, on how you're putting them in there. But really, that this is kind of in, inconsequential. It doesn't matter. 
Um, so you just want to make sure that you define the groups and you say continue. You're going to want to do one final option, so step seven. You'll make sure that the Man Went EU test is selected. So under that um, two boxes there, you'll see it says test type, and then it has a bunch of different tests. Don't worry about the other ones. Um, we're not going to cover those or, or use those at all. We're just going to focus on the first one that says Man Went EU, which is the test we want. And then the last thing you want to do is click options. And then you want to make sure that the box is checked for descriptive statistics and then missing values excluded case by test. Um, don't worry about those two things. This is just, um, so for descriptives, we just wanna know things like how many people responded, right? So these are the same things that you would already see in your um, Google Forms in the visualizations. We're just getting it to give those to us as well because it helps us to contextualize the results we're looking at. And missing values is just making sure that the test isn't using misses, missing values um, in your analysis. So if, if a teacher didn't respond to a question, we don't want that empty blank um, to be shown as a response. We just want it to be avoided completely because it'll skew our data. All right, and we let the statistical magic commence, but we know exactly what SPSS is doing, right? So once we click OK to run the test, we know that SPSS is comparing every single person to every other person and looking at their scores and seeing if one person's score is higher than the other person's score for every single person. So once we do that and our magical unicorns in the background have done their analysis, um, we would interpret our results. So this is really where the rubber hits the road here and we're really at the final end of this process. So. You're going to get, um, it's called your your results output here. So a, a window will appear in SPSS on your computer, and it'll show um, what you're seeing here. So it'll show a table that's, that's labeled ranks and then test statistics. There are other information there, but we don't need those. Um, we can ignore the other tables there. You can completely ignore those, and we're just focused on these two tables, nothing else, um, because this tells us exactly what we need to know. So what we want to do is we want to look in our ranks table um, for the column that says mean rank. And each of these numbers represents the sum of all the ratings by an individual added up for each group. So you can see here that the total score for SPED teachers is, long, is uh, greater than gen teachers. So what this is telling us is that the... Um, the number of responses that were for for a particular um, practice are are higher are are higher for that highest rank option um, for sped teachers than they are for gen teachers. So gen so sped teachers in this first table here, our table is telling us that spe, sped teachers are selecting the highest response option. So maybe that's expert um, more than gen teachers are, right? So this is this is pretty similar. It's, a, it's um, a different way of thinking about those bar charts, right? So in the same way bar charts are telling us if gen or sped teachers had um, selected a response more than, um, than each other. <coughs> so, but that's always where those bar charts stop, and that's really what this table tells us here, that um, which, which group had a higher number of responses for the highest response. Uh, response options. So, maybe, so in this example here, for, for our actual data example here, that's expert. So our rank table is telling us that SPED teachers selected expert more often than gen teachers. And they also selected intermediate more often. <coughs> so we see that these numbers, these mean ranks here, are, are different, right? Um, but are they statistically significantly different? Meaning, is the number 43.25 greater then 17.75 above and beyond chance. So this number being more, this the number of, of SPED teachers selecting um, expert is more than gen teachers, and that's above and beyond chance. That it's 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 for some other reason than just random chance, um, a, a flip you know flip of the coin or or a flip of the card, right? So. In order to to understand whether or not this is a statistically significant difference, our Man Whitney U test has run what's called a Z test, <coughs> and um, 
So the the important thing to know, don't get hung up on why it's called a z-score. Um, the thing to know is that this is our test statistic. So this is the 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 numer the numerical response, right? The number that tells us whether or not our test, our Man Whitney U test, is um, showing a difference between these two groups that is uh, happening above and beyond random chance. And this test statistic tells us the magnitude of the difference between the two groups. So the larger the z-score, the greater the difference. So this tells us, we when we look at 43.25 and 17.75, we see that those two numbers are different from each other, right? So 43.25 is larger. Um, and the z-score is saying that, that yes, um, those are larger and the z-score is negative and it's telling us that the gen teacher number that 17.75 is is less is statistically significantly less than um, 43.25 and we know that because our test for um, significance is less than 0.05 so this test always compares the first group to the second group so the z-score is negative because gen teachers um, rank that 17.75 is much smaller than sped teachers mean rank of 43.25. Um, below the, like I just said, the below the negative 6.036, we have the statistical significance and we're looking to see if that number is less than 0.05 because that tells us that there is a greater than 95% chance that this difference is not due to random chance and that difference is meaningful. Um, so we see here that zero zero zero, right? So that's less than 0 0.05. So that tells us there's a 95% chance that this difference is not due to random chance. So the best way to um, visualize the z-score here is to think about the concept of the standard distribution. And that states that um, scores will group close to the average score for all the groups combined. So in this example, gen and sped teachers. And there will be less scores as the scores get higher and also less scores as the scores get lower or further away from that average. The differences between these higher and lower scores um, compared to the whole group average are measured in what we call deviations. And you can, you can imagine deviations like the steps on a ladder and each step of the ladder is the same length as the next. Um, so some people are taking more steps away from um, from the middle um, on that ladder, the average, than others. And in our example here, we so we going back to that, we have um, negative 6.036, which tells us that the average score for gen teachers is six steps on that ladder, lower from the whole group average, which is 1.9. Um, so that's almost intermediate level. And as a benchmark, this is, um, it's true that 99.7% of all scores will be less than three steps away. So six steps is very, very, very large. Um, and I got that 1.9, my, my whole group average for both SPEN and GED teachers combined by looking at my descriptive statistics table. Um, so that's also in that output. Remember in our settings, we, we told it to give us that. So you can ignore any results from result, they're meaningless. Um, but for mean there, we see 1.9 is, is just about intermediate level. Um, so we interpret this as, so our scores for um, general education teachers are far, 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 far below intermediate um, and, and expert level. They, they are by large novice um, and the amount of individuals who are gen teachers in this example who are novices is much greater than those sped teachers who are, who are novices. Um, and it's statistically significantly different, which means that there's a 95% chance that that's not due um, to chance, that, that this group difference is 95% is sure that this is not due to chance, that we know that these differences are meaningful, that they're significant from each other. Um, so that's our example here. And then, so keeping all that in mind, so we know that our gen teachers, um, like in this example, have less skill than our SPED teachers in this particular practice. Then how do we write that test up? Well, here's how we do it. 
Um, keep in mind that um, you're not going to be using all of the numbers when you do your write-up. Just like when we have our, our write-up from our Likert scales, we're just using the results that are, are pertinent for us or our multi-choice, right? We're just using some of, some of the statistics. That's why not everything is shown. We're just giving people what they need to know in order to um, help them understand both what was different and how different it was, right? So you want to let people know in your write-up here for a Man Whitney U test about who was different, um, uh, what you know, and what was the magnitude of that difference, and then if there was a difference, was it statistically significant? So here in my example, I have a Man Whitney U test was run to see if there was a difference between scores between general education and special education teachers. Results showed that mean rank for general education teachers, right, we, we know from our chart there in our ranks chart was 17.75 and that was statistically significantly less than special education teachers, which is 43.25. Um, we use our Z-score, remember that tells us how many la uh, steps on the ladder away uh, or the standard dis distribution um, this the 17.75 is and that is 6.036 uh, that's negative right because they're, they're walking down that ladder and we put our statistical our p-value right so our p-value is uh, represents just like n represents sample our p value represents significance level and remembering that greater than 0.05 is not significant less than 0.05 is significant and that p is the symbol we use to represent the significance level and when the number is less than 0.05 we can say that there is a greater than 95 percent chance that the difference between two groups is due to something other than random chance so when the number is 0.05 or less, we right. So if the number is <clears throat> is 0.05, we say that it is um, not above and beyond random chance. But if it's you know 0.04, right, 0.04999999, as long as it's less than 0.05, we can say that there is a greater than 95% chance that the difference between our two groups is due to something other than random chance. So to recap, the goals of your quantitative analysis are to look at your ranking questions first um, and look for the highest and lowest rank practices. Then you're going to look for your multi-grid -right, uh, ranking questions and identify strengths and areas of need. You'll look at your cross tabs, so which specific groups do something more often, have more knowledge or skill. And then going off of that more often or knowledge or skill, you'll then say, okay, is that is that difference due to something more than chance than a random flip of the coin or roll of the dice, right? So then you'll look at some maybe along the lines of which groups need more help than others, which groups have a greater um, strength level um, or, less, or, or less knowledge or skill than others. And that leaves us to your homework. So this Sunday uh, at 11.59, your homework number one is due. Um, homework number one in terms of your quantitative module here, right? Not homework one in terms of your action organizer, which we've been doing ongoing. So in order to do this homework, you're going to complete three questions. First, you're going to analyze a bar chart. Um, this example right here. So you're going to analyze the bar chart and write up the results in a short paragraph, as we've shown in this uh, video lecture. And then you will... Um, work on the second question, which is analyzing line charts for a multiple choice ranking grid question. Same thing, you're going to um, look at this chart right here, and then you're going to write up the documents in a, uh, write up the results in a Word document, and that same Word document, just have one Word document for all three questions. Um, for the previous question, this one and the next one I'm going to show you. And your goal for this is to identify the highest rank, the lowest rank areas of need. Um, in this example here. So your your goal for this part of the homework assignment is to find which of these practices is the highest area of skill and which is the lowest area. There will be multiple. And then finally you'll look at just the output of a uh, fictional test here. So you don't have to work with any data in SPSS or download or to do anything. Just look at this slide here. Um, and what I want you to do is to write up the results of the test just like we showed before. Um, 
where I had written, you know, my man Whitney U test is run to see if there was a difference between the two groups, and then the mean rank um, was statistically significant, blah, 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 not significant, um, what those numbers were. So you're, what you're going to need to do for this last question is to tell me um, what test was run, uh, what groups are compared, um, what the mean ranks for each of those groups are, and then whether or not the the difference between those two mean ranks is statistically significantly different. Um, and from that, I want you to tell me which group um, has has a higher mean rank than the other, a statistically significant higher rank. So do gen teachers um, in this example here have a higher score than sped teachers, or do sped teachers have a higher score than um, gen teachers? Tell me the direction of that relationship. So are gen teachers scoring higher or are sped teachers scoring higher? What's the direction of that relationship? So you can follow exactly the example on slide 38 um, in your content module PowerPoint, and that'll tell you exactly how to write this up. And that's it for this video.